I ask if you would please take your Bible and let's open to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 and I'm going to reference Luke 2 also. If you don't get turned there quick enough, I'll read it to you. It'll be up on the screen. Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to read verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In Luke chapter 2, we read in verses 13 and 14, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Jesus speaking to his disciples with very troubled hearts looked at them and said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Let's bow together. Father, Help us to know peace. By knowing you. Help us to have peace. By receiving it from you. Help us to be peacemakers. In the world in which we've been placed. As your disciples. For those that may be here with conflicted souls, those that may be here today with troubled hearts, those who may listen to this sermon later, I pray for that peace. Lord, today may we leave here knowing more about what it means for you to be called the Prince of Peace. I ask this to your glory and in your name. Amen. Do you have peace today? Do you have peace today? Our definition of peace that we often use is just feeling good when things are going good. You know, if, if there's nothing bad happening, I'm at peace. If something is troubling me, I'm not at peace. And that's not the peace that we're talking about. It's not the peace that Jesus carried as the, as the Prince of Peace. It's not the peace that he gives and it's certainly not the peace the angels declared that day to the shepherds. This kind of peace can face anything. It's a supernatural satisfaction. It comes from the Holy Spirit within the heart of the believer. It is produced by God. It's a supernatural giftedness that every Christian possesses. And this is the kind of peace that I pray and hope and that I declare to you today that we might leave here all knowing Jesus as that Prince of Peace. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah gives us these words that, that I, you just can't help but to read every Christmas season. And when it and in it, when I read it, I see John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave. And I read Isaiah's passage in Isaiah 9, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And we see in these words where God in all of his wisdom and all of his glory gave his son, sent his son, and it was to us. It is to the believers, it is to Christians, to Israel. It is to all who would turn their eyes and hearts to Jesus Christ. Jesus has been given. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I see these words here. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders. This is looking to the future for us. This is looking to the time when Jesus will rule this world in absolute peace for 1,000 years. We'll see the millennial reign of Christ such that the world has never known because for the first time ever this entire world will know peace. Peace. We talk about it. We want it. 
We pass laws for it. We pass laws to preserve it. There's wars, rumors of wars. All of this happens under the guise of peace so many times. And then we are given his name, Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. These wonderful attributes of the Lord Jesus who was born, that we celebrate his birth, God who has come in the flesh, God who has dwelt among us, the wonder of it, the beauty of it, the counselor that he would counsel us to believe upon him, that he would counsel us to taste of him and to see that he is good, that we might come to him when our hearts are very troubled and we might bring our burdens to him. The Lord is good, folks. And he's the everlasting father. But that last description is the one I want to talk to you about this morning. The Prince of Peace. As I stand here today, I want to ask you a question. And it's not a loaded question, but it's an obvious answer. Is this world at peace today? Not at all. Very little peace do we see anywhere today. When I read these words, I'm thinking of a future time when we will see peace. And yet I recognize that as today is called today, I can and you can have peace with the Lord, with your heart and your life and your soul, with others. Only through the birth of God's Son could the process of true, lasting peace begin. It began with his coming. When we celebrate the birth of Jesus, we're celebrating the beginning of the peace that is to come, that is available to us. There are three areas that Jesus brings this wonderful peace to. The greatest need that a fallen world has, that a world that has rejected God, the world that has turned its back on God, the world who took the Creator and all the beauty that He created. And they likened it as unto a chance, a moment, billions of years. The greatest need this world has to be, re re to be reconciled to God. That's a source of peace. We need that today. This world needs peace with God. Folks, we need to be at peace with others. It's not a matter of getting along with others. We're, we're, we're entering the holidays. <laughs> I was reading a, a little blog about political hot buttons to bring to the table. <laughs> at Thanksgiving, I thought, well, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to, to, to bring that to the table and then out of morbid curiosity, I read it. <laughs> and, and I said, definitely red buttons. It, it would fire up a divided family. But we want peace with each other. Jesus can give us that. And then, folks, I want to tell you something. There are many and probably here today. And they may not quite be able to put their thumb on it and exactly what they're experiencing, but the truth is, Deep in their soul, they need peace in their mind and in their life and in their heart. There is no harder place to be than to be conflicted and struggling. As a matter of fact, I believe that there's two areas that we would suffer the most in regard to peace. One is the soul that's been awakened through the conviction of the Holy Spirit of a need for salvation and then to continually harden our heart toward that. That is a terrible place to be. And then the other is for a born-again believer in Christ to be out in the world, to be dabbling with sin, to have that beautiful relationship and fellowship with the Lord tainted by poor decisions. A Christian living in disobedience and a lost person living with a convicted heart. Both need that beautiful peace 
that the Lord leaves. Jesus said to his disciples that I leave my peace with you, but not as the world does. The peace that I leave with you can pass all understanding. The peace that I'm giving you can get you through any moment. The peace that I am now sharing with you is going to allow you to see me die on a cross, to know that I've been buried in the ground, and to get up and face the next day. That's the kind of peace I'm leaving you. John Piper wrote a little booklet. It's, it's short. I think the booklet's 60 pages, but I really only think it's about 30 pages of print in it. It's a lot of, po it's a lot of art in it. And tonight I'm going to be sharing about no room for Jesus at the end. And I was reading this little booklet that he produced several years ago about the innkeeper. And the, the premise of the book is real simple. It's Jesus on the way to the cross, stopping at the place he was born to see the people that provided for his mother and father. It's a sweet little book. It's really precious. And that gentleman is depicted without a limb, lost an arm, without a wife, and without two children. And as the little narrative is told, it's explained and understood that when Herod sent out the decree to kill all of the male children under a certain specific age, two of the innkeeper's children were taken. His wife, trying to defend them, was killed. And him, trying to defend them, he lost an arm. I know that sounds graphic, but when I was reading that, I thought, such troubled heart, conflicted, such loss and such grief. Folks, people walk amongst us all the time stricken with loss and grief. I would pray that we would be mindful of them, but more so than that, and we should be, but more so than that, I want to present you to the Lord who can give you a peace to overcome even those types of tragedies. The little story ends, by the way, kind of abruptly. Jesus tells them, I am the one. He remembered the night the, the innkeeper did. He said, I'm the boy that was born that night in the midst of all of your anguish, a year later losing your children and your wife. I'm going to die on a cross in Jerusalem but I will rise again in authority over he who holds the keys. I will trample his head and take the keys. And I will see to it in my resurrection that your wife and those two children will rise again. For their hope was in the consolation of Israel and they longed for their Messiah. It's a beautiful story. But in that little story, I saw such a proclamation of peace in the midst of so much trouble. The word peace that we find, the word is shalom or shalom. It is still used as a greeting. After the resurrection, it was a greeting between the disciples peace from a, from a troubled heart from the moment of that horrible death to the joy of resurrection from that point on they would greet one another with shalom peace peace it's not a bad practice is it if we could wish peace on everyone we met if, if we could gather in this place and we could encourage peace for everyone that's here if we would share Christ in a world that's lost and undone knowing that with him comes peace, it would make all the difference in the world. 
This peace that I speak of is not known to a lost person, but to the saved. To the saved, there are great benefits. Jesus told his disciples after he told them he was going to die, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. This is going to lead to the statement, my peace I give you. The peace that Jesus gives will soothe a troubled heart. It will bring relief to a troubled heart. People who are suffering and miserable, those who are near death, many times will send word, can, can you come and see me or, or to me, can Brother Bud come and see me? And I've sat down with many, many people through the years of, of being a pastor. And what it is is they, they usually don't want to leave. And death is something that's an uncertainty. Death in and of itself is a mystery to all of us. But as you're looking at it and you're breathing, knowing that you're ebbing toward it, ultimately what they want to know is, am I going to heaven? And do I have peace with the Lord? For my heart is very troubled. It's always been a joy to share with others that we can have peace with God and peace with the circumstances of our life. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 tells us there's a time for everything under the sun. A time to mourn, a time to laugh, a, a time to cry, a time to die, a time to live, a time for war, a time for peace. It just gives us a a hodgepodge of all the things that life entails. And all of us that have lived long enough know that there are moments in life that are mountaintops. There's moments in life that, are, that can't be topped. They're just wonderful. And they're great, sweet, satisfying memories. Then we also know there are times in life that are horrible, that are dreadful. I'm not going to paint a picture that's not real. But this peace that the Lord gives us in those types of moments, no matter where we are, can help us overcome it. My peace I give to you to help soothe a troubled heart. Another area that this peace, this peace that we as believers possess the Bible says this peace will guard our hearts and also our mind from fear and anxiety. <clears throat> when the uncertainty of life overwhelms us and we're not quite sure what tomorrow's going to hold. I read this morning, it just made me so sad. About 3.50 this morning I read this headline of this large furniture company, and you may have read it too, this all of a sudden, right before Thanksgiving, right before Christmas, right before the holidays, they fired every one of their employees. Thousands lost their jobs just like, just like that. Can you imagine that? Just like that, losing your livelihood. The first email that went out told them not to report to work followed by a second that explained to them that because of unforeseen circumstances that they were terminated, that their benefits were terminated. Everything that they were receiving from the company as full-time employees terminated. Folks, I don't know about you, but that's a moment that anxiety can creep in and fear. What am I going to do? This peace that Jesus gives us, <clears throat> it can guard our hearts against these things. Listen to this verse. And I quote this verse all the time. <clears throat> Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Listen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind 
through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Isn't it wonderful to know that whatever this world might hand us in any moment that might create, a, create fear and panic, whenever that comes that we know that while everything around us is falling, we are not going to fall at all. We're held, we're kept, we're on a firm foundation to the glory of God. Jesus gives us peace beyond any circumstance that we might face. If you're here today and you're troubled and you're anxious and you're worried, follow, follow the instructions of this scripture. If you're a believer, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. With thanksgiving, bring those requests to the Lord and the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. That's a promise, folks. It's the benefit of the peace. When the peace of the Lord God rules our hearts, when we have peace in our hearts with God and peace in our hearts with circumstances and peace in our heart over fears and anxiety and peace in our hearts over eternity, we will find that we can be at peace among our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Folks, there may be people right now going through those moments where the anxiety and the fear is cranked up. We need to be a place and we need to be a people that they can come and we can encourage them. We can testify of God's goodness and greatness. We can help them. We can encourage and pray for them and walk with them. We can be the peacemakers that the Lord intends for us to be. Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you are called in one body and be thankful. The unity of the peace of God that calls us into a single body will keep us at peace no matter what. I believe that part of what the angels declared to the shepherds I believe a large portion of what Isaiah quoted other than the birth and the coming of a child speaks to the messianic reign of Jesus Christ. It's our future. But I'm telling you the day is going to come when King Jesus will rule and we will see with our own eyes the absolute reality of him being the Prince of Peace on this earth. The Bible says he will rule with a rod of iron. Haley and I were just talking about this the other night at Thanksgiving about the return of Christ and him ruling and the peace that we would see. And where I don't understand everything about it and I don't understand and we were discussing our roles within that kingdom. I, there's a lot we do know, there's a lot we don't know. But one thing I do know, as sure as I'm standing here today, this world, see, when Jesus returns, there'll be lost people left on this earth. The dead in Christ, the resurrected, will come with him, the Bible says, and we'll come back to this earth, those that have been saved in grace. And the Bible, Jesus taught that we will reign with him. Larry, you figured that one out yet, brother? <laughs> I'm still chewing on that one. There's a lot I don't understand about it, but I believe it. Where I may not quite understand all of this one, but I know this, he will rule and he will reign. There's no doubt in my mind about that in the day in which he is coming. Romans 14, 17 says, The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is what it's all about. Righteousness, peace, and joy. This is what the world will experience. To have a, a, a someone in leadership that's not there out of fear or there out, of, out of, 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 of a desire to be wealthy or rich or power. He is rich. He is powerful. There's no one above him. He, he owns everything. There's nothing that the Lord needs but he will rule and we will be a part of that 
How can we consider Jesus to be the Prince of Peace? The Prince of Peace. Well, the first is, and I mentioned this, but real quickly. He's the Prince of Peace because He has come to reconcile us to God. Everyone that is born is born separate, born a sinner, born with a nature that's going to sin and that will sin. I believe is sin. I know we look at an innocent baby and, and we coo and, and oo over them. We had our grandson this, this weekend and I can't look at him and think anything uh, is sinful about him. But I know that little baby that I held and Tracy held and Haley held and passed off to all the grandparents and uncles and aunts, that baby needs Jesus to be saved. And my prayer is that in time he'll come to know Christ. Jesus Christ came to make peace between us and God. And whether you believe this or acknowledge it or not, I think we all should. But we know that in us dwells no good thing. We know that we're rebellious at heart and that we're sinful human beings. And even after we're saved, we take so much for granted. The Bible says that while we were enemies of God, separate from Him, Romans 5.10 says we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. What Jesus did on the cross, He was born to die, we know that. Christmas have its cradle, Easter has its cross, one of Tracy's favorite songs. We know that. But we've got to understand the purpose for that was that we might have salvation, that we might be reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus came so that he could pay the price for our sin, so that God's wrath could be appeased, because God is always going to pour wrath out on sin. And because of the fact that we were sinful, and because of the fact that we were rebellious, and that we could do nothing about it, God did something about it in sending Jesus. The peace that we have and the forgiveness that we have are for those who would trust in Christ and the salvation that he offers. Romans 5.1 says, Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, folks, I'm going to ask you, I asked you earlier, do you have peace? I'm going to ask you again. Are you at peace with the Lord God? Are you at peace with eternity? Are you at peace with where you will spend eternity? Because if you're not, I'm telling you today, you can. You can have that peace. So we have peace through the reconciliation of the death of Christ, the resurrection, the free, beautiful gospel the good news that God has given His Son. There's also peace on earth or the Prince of Peace by the fact that Jesus has given us and sent. He said that it's expedient that I go away for the paraclete will come. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, you and I can't imagine life apart from the Spirit. In Christ, we were sealed by the Spirit. We've been filled by the Spirit. We're empowered by the Spirit. We're equipped through the Spirit. And folks, peace is one of the attributes and gifts of the Spirit. So we have that. So when we feel anxious inside, when we uh, uh, feel panicky, that peace that is in us, we just turn to the Lord. It's there. We don't have to go looking for it. It's not in a bottle, and it's not in a doctor's office. We can bow our head, and the one who made us is there and has promised his peace to us. We don't have to be afraid of today or tomorrow. And we certainly understand the battles. Let me ask you, I'm going to give a few. You acknowledge to me. You say, oh, me. You don't have to say amen because these aren't good. But if this regards, if it applies to you, just say, oh, me. Anybody here tempted to sin? <laughs> do you deal with fear and uncertainty? Mm, do you feel with doubts? Yes. Well, I don't want anybody to think that I'm weak. I don't worry about nothing. I don't doubt anything. <laughs> I 
I do. Amen? I have moments. I prayed this morning back behind the church as before I came in, and I said, Lord, I ask that you're glorified through the preaching of your word. I'm so sorry that I'm what you have. He deserves better. I would like to say that there's not a moment or a second of any day that there's not conflict, but there's not a moment of any day there's not conflict. When the Apostle Paul said, I know what I should be doing, but I'm not, and the things I ought to be doing, I'm not doing them, and the things I shouldn't be doing, this is what I think about. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall save me? Well, Jesus is the one who will save us. I feel like when I come to the Lord and just asking Him to feel and to anoint and to bless the preaching of his word. I feel like there's a repetitive prayer so many times. Lord, it's me again. It's me again. <laughs> I'm so grateful for the Lord's patience and his grace and his mercy. I'm so glad that the blood has paid the price and penalty. I recognize the effect of sin and the place of fellowship and service. Folks, I'm going to tell you, we need to understand that in this world, we are going to have some battles. But the peace of God, the peace of God gives us a place of comfort in the middle of these conflicts. And listen to this, Christian. As the, G, as the Holy Spirit who's been given us, molds us and makes us into the men and women that God requires and wants of us to be. Disciples of Jesus, little Christians, little Christ running around, <laughs> preaching the gospel of the kingdom and just living for Him. When we're doing that, let me tell you what we start doing. We're going to be more loving. He's going to mold us into be more Christ-like. Are there times when you don't really feel very Christ-like? When you're impatient or you lash out or you say something unkind and you regret the words as they're coming out of your mouth. Oh, but the Holy Spirit at work in us as we yield our lives to Him and let Him sand down those rough edges and let Him convict us of things we need to get rid of and to do the things that we should do. He'll guard our mouth and our words and our attitudes. Oh, how grateful I am that the Lord makes us into Christ-like people. And you know what happens then when we start acting like Jesus and living like Jesus and thinking like Jesus? We're going to love like Him and we're going to forgive like Him. Brother Bud, Jesus ain't got no idea what I've been through. You think? You reckon? I bet we don't have any idea of what somebody's been through that Jesus on the cross could ask his father to forgive the ones who were crucifying him and mocking him and jeering him is beyond my ability. So Jesus is the Prince of Peace because he reconciles us to God. He's the Prince of Peace because the Holy Spirit is molding and making and filling us and equipping us. And folks, he is the Prince of Peace because he will return in glory and he will bring pre peace to this world. But I want you to hear how he does it. John, the revelator, verse chapter 19 says this, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. That's Jesus, by the way. And in righteousness he judges, listen, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. 
and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He came as innocently, as vulnerable as a person could come the first time. It ain't going to be that way the second time. He's coming as the rightful owner and heir of the universe. And he will rule. But with that, there'll be peace. There'll be peace. I read a little narrative. It's, it's, it's a poem, but it's one of the poems that you just read. You know, I'm a redneck. I think poems should have rhyming words. This doesn't have rhyming words, okay? <laughs> but it's a poem. It's Joseph Bailey wrote this. I want you to hear this and see if you agree with me. Praise God for Christmas. Praise Him for the incarnation, for the Word made flesh. I will not sing of shepherds watching flocks on frosty nights or angel choristers. I will not sing of a stable bear in Bethlehem or lowing oxen, wise men trailing star with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Tonight I will sing praise to the Father who stood on heaven's threshold and said farewell to his son as he stepped across the stars to Bethlehem and Jerusalem. And I will sing praise to the infinite, eternal Son who became most finite, a baby who would one day be executed for my crimes. Praise Him in the heavens. Praise Him in the stable. Praise Him in my heart. Amen. Folks, that's what Christmas is all about. Let's bow together. Father, speak to our hearts about these things. I pray for the one who's here today with no peace. I pray for the one who is convicted of their need for salvation. Lord, that you would just continue the work that you started. And I pray for them to be saved. And I believe that you will save those whom you're dealing with. I pray for the Christian today who knows better, who knows to live better, but who's not. And because of decisions and choices, they're living a life conflicted when they know there's a better life. I pray, God, for that conviction that comes, that we might confess that our relationship and our fellowship might be restored. As David prayed, create in me a clean heart. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Lord, I pray that. Lord, I pray as we enter into this season that captivates us and drags us, as Kirby said earlier, to the secular, that we would resist that this year and that we would focus our hearts and our minds on the whole purpose and reason that we've set this time aside. The reason that we celebrate is because of your gift. Lord, I pray that we might leave here today understanding who the Prince of Peace is. And I ask it in Jesus' name. To thy glory we pray. Amen.